Regional Lecture Series of the USF Department of Anthropology. I am uh, Professor Jayaram, an assistant professor in the department and chair of this committee. And today I'm excited to uh, bring back uh, Professors Mahoney and Bear, as well as their students uh, to present some of their research. We'll be talking about COVID politics and student experiences during COVID. Um, and uh, that's all I really want to say. The point of this lecture series is to highlight uh, anthropological takes on important topics of the time, as well as to highlight some of the research going on in our department and our university and across uh, throughout our networks. So with that being said, that's all I want to really say to introduce things. And I'll have, uh, I'll turn this over to Professor Mahoney. Okay, um, I'm Robbie Bear. I'm going to uh, begin. I want to thank everybody for coming today. And um, this was a project done by three classes of anthropology students during the fall of uh, 2020. Uh, Dr. Mahoney and I were looking for a way <coughs> to um, do something a little more exciting in an online class format. And we decided this form of class project was manageable. Uh, very anthropological in that we had our students uh, investigating the um, lived experiences of other students, lived experiences they were sharing as we all went through the second semester of the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, we have with us today two of the graduate assistants, Emily Holbrook and Shane White, who um, have worked on the project and also Sophia Almeida, one of the students who was in one of the classes in Dr. Mahoney's class and who has stayed on to work on the additional analysis this semester. The initial analysis <coughs> was done by the uh, students in the classes in the fall of 2020. I want to note that the data were collected in the early part of the fall of 2020 so if you're seeing things that you think differ from the way you think people think about them now, uh, that would be because all of our opinions have shifted somewhat uh, since the early fall of 2020. Next slide, please. I also wanna say there are a couple of other students who worked on the analysis this semester who are not able to be uh, with us for the presentation today. So we evaluated the impact of COVID-19 on college students. Uh, we looked at the knowledge of COVID-19, how they accessed information. <coughs> the project uh, also looked at students' perspectives on Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. We will not be presenting those, uh, the second uh, part of the data set today. Please tune in uh, next fall and we'll get to that. <coughs> And we thought we were analyzing the data from a unique perspective because we had the students each interview one Democrat and one Republican, another USF student, each who identified with each of the two major parties in the United States. This was long before anybody was looking at the effect of political party identification on perspectives about anything associated with COVID-19. Sophia, is it yours? Uh, yes. Um, so three of our main goals here were to document the understandings and behaviors and responses to the pandemic, particularly among college students. Um, then we wanted to identify any specific needs that students brought up as we interviewed them and that they identified. And then from that, after we analyzed everything, we wanted to recommend and um, recommend any policies and programs that we could use to bring equity and safeness to students, faculty, and staff. So um, through this, we put out a 54 question interview guide that we had other students um, give during the course of the semester. Um, and previous reports had looked at how vulnerable communities responded to COVID-19, 
but this project was particularly unique because it shed light on the like mainstream American consciousness that these vulnerable communities operate in. And what's really special about this project was that everything was conducted remotely by students. So it was kind of interesting to look at it that way. And these data were then further analyzed by political party, race, and gender. So some key demographic patterns that showed up, um, we actually started with an N of 170, but ended up uh, removing outliers uh, to a smaller N of around 150. And we found that the majority of our um, participants were female and the majority of those females were actually Democrats and the majority of those males were actually Republicans. And because the interviews were conducted in upper level undergraduate courses, the majority of the school years that our participants were in were juniors and seniors and our average age was around 21, but we had ages ranging from 18 to 56. Um, we also broke our sample up into different census categories, which um, our sample actually ended up being 55% white and 45% non-white. And um, of interest with this is that um, uh, the Republicans were more likely to be white uh, versus Democrats were more likely to be non-white. And particularly upon uh, Hispanic and Latin, Latinx uh, groups, this was a dramatic divide and that most of the majority of the Hispanic Latinx uh, tended to be Democrats. Um, so perspectives on learning, uh, what we found here was that um, when we asked what was preferred, 46% of our respondents said that they preferred face-to-face -face versus 41% that said that they preferred online learning. But um, what was really interesting about this was the political divide. So Republicans were more likely to say that they preferred face-to-face uh, -face learning options because they learned better and they feared missing out on social aspects of being face-to-face. Whereas Democrats were more likely to say that they preferred online learning because they felt that it was safer and it was easier to manage. Uh, as far as main worries that we asked students what they were concerned about with education online, they actually said that they were most worried about how learning online was going to impact their educational pathways rather than their own health, which was interesting. And that was consistent across both party lines. Um, as far as getting sick, 24% uh, said that face-to-face -face was worrying because they didn't want to get sick. 16% just flat out said they didn't care. And 11% said that they weren't really worried because they had gotten used to learning online. Um, as far as education, we asked students to sort of give a self-assessment as to how they were faring online. 45% um, said good, 39 said fair, and 16 poor. But Democrats were more likely to say that they were doing better than Republicans who were more likely to say that they were doing bad. As far as the reasoning behind how they were doing, 47% um, said that they were easily distracted with online learning. Um, around 30% said that it was difficult because there was a lack of communication and social interaction. And around 10% said that these classes were never meant to be online. So it was very difficult for them to adjust to learning online. Uh, as far as why it was easier to learn online, 43% uh, said that it was easier and more comfortable and this was actually divided by political party. Uh, Democrats were more likely to say that it was easier versus the Republicans who said it was much harder. And okay. yes. <laughs> um, moving forward, we're going to present these five different categories of results. We're going to talk about knowledge about COVID-19 and the strategies that participants use to uh, reduce their risk. And we're also going to give information on um, perspectives on masks, testing, and vaccines. But before we do all of that, we want to discuss um, and shed some light on how our participants were choosing or explaining um, their political party identification, because that is the main analysis that um, we have done for this presentation. So the most popular response with 41% um, and the most popular response for Democrats was policies. So for example, um, one white woman Republican uh, said, I identify as a Republican because I'm in favor of stronger borders. 
lower taxes, greater enforcement of criminal law and the criminal justice system, and upholding the concept of checks and balances. Um, and then across the aisle, a white Democrat woman explained this by drawing on these policies. She said, I identify with Democrats because I believe in minimum wage and progressive taxation, a supportive stance on gay marriage, a right to universal health care, or at least basic needs being met, a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, um, a woman having access to quality reproductive services and climate change as an ongoing threat to our economy. So um, everyone in that category then said specific policies that they supported and that was their reason for being either Republican or Democrat. In the second category, this was the second most popular reasoning for Democrats and the least most popular reasoning for Republicans. One white male Republican um, in this values category said he is Republican because it has real American values um, that I care about. And then compare that we have um, an Asian female Democrat saying, my beliefs are left leaning and the Democratic Party tries to help the public as a whole. The party's platform is based on equality and helping people. And then in our third reasoning, um, this is kind of like the other category. There's a lot of different themes being discussed here. This is um, the least most popular category for Democrats to explain their political party identification, but almost the same number of Republicans um, said this 35% as the policies 36%. Um, and within here, there is explanations like family, um, changing affiliation, that they dislike both parties, or they just generally feel forced to choose one party in the US system. Okay, so when we ask about knowledge about COVID, um, we started our questionnaire by asking several questions to see what people know about it. Um, the, one of the questions we asked is, how did you learn about COVID-19? Um, the most popular categories you can see, people were talking about learning about it from the news, from social media, from parents or friends, um, or other sources such as school. When we asked people, what do you call this new illness? Most participants, almost all participants gave um, an official answer. We got a lot of people saying COVID-19, people calling it COVID, Corona, Rona, um, but we did get two more racialized answers. Those were both from 19-year-old um, Republicans. So one said Kung flu and the other answered Chinese virus is what they call it. When we asked them, how concerned about COVID are you? Um, 51% said they were very or extremely concerned, but um, Democrats were much more likely to be in this category. We had 58 out of 80 Democrats saying that they were very extremely concerned about COVID compared to only 18 Republicans. The middle category, there's 34% um, slightly or moderately concerned. That was split pretty evenly between the, the political parties. And then when we had 14% saying that they were not at all concerned um, there's again a political party divide there. 19 of those um, people were Republicans compared to only two Democrats. Following up on that, we asked them, why are you worried about COVID-19? Um, the most popular responses were things like they were worried about affecting other people and they were worried about the illness in general and its lasting effects. 15% of people said that they were not concerned because um, of their age group was not susceptible to COVID. And then we had 16 of those uh, were Republicans compared to just six Democrats. And another popular response was um, they, they were afraid that COVID-19 was going to affect their lifestyle. And there were actually more Democrats than Republicans um, saying that. Kind of importantly, when we break that down by Republicans and Democrats, there's this difference. 21% of Republicans just generally said that COVID is not that bad and they're not worried about it. And then 4% went further um, and said that the COVID is not real and or that um, the virus is a politically motivated. Whereas Democrats were more likely um, to say something like, they were worried that other people were not following the rules. There was a lot of discourse about rule following um, or that they were not taking the pandemic seriously. 14% of Democrats were saying that. 
and then um, eight percent of Democrats were also worried that the government was not taking COVID-19 seriously enough. We then asked, um, we asked participants, what about COVID are you most worried about? The two more popular responses, 65% um, of people were talking about they were worried about their family, friends, or others becoming sick or dying. And one fourth then talked about their own mortality or health. Democrats were generally more likely um, to, to be worried about COVID in general. Um, and then to break it down, besides being more generally worried, Democrats were much more worried about the COVID's impact on their education. Whereas Republicans, when they were worried, they were more worried about the economic and political fallout from the, from the virus. Um, we then asked people, what do you know about COVID-19 and assess their knowledge um, across like a few different questions. Um, of both parties, both were talking a lot about like, it's highly contagious, it's a virus, it's like the flu. People could name specific symptoms, they could give treatments, um, preventative measures. So there wasn't a big difference between political party with that. Um, there was 31% of Republicans compared to 21% of Democrats discussing how the virus originated in China. And then again, um, there's this idea of like rule following coming up again. 28% of Democrats indicated that others were um, not following the precautions or taking it seriously. And like that was why it was spreading compared to only 7% of Republicans were talking about that. Um, across these, like the, the takeaway from this across these questions is that it seems that Democrats showed more knowledge um, about COVID, about the symptoms and treatments and preventative measures. But when we asked um, a question specifically about what is the cause of the virus, more Democrats, 15, compared to Republicans said that they just didn't know the cause. So that kind of challenges our general idea that Democrats were more knowledgeable. We also um, asked participants about risk reduction strategies. The first question in the series was, what do authorities say you should do to avoid getting COVID? Um, the four most popular responses were wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands, and limited exposure. All of those were quite high. They're all above 50% of people um, saying that's, they know that that's what the authorities say that you should do to avoid getting COVID. Um, when we asked them, what are you actually doing to avoid getting COVID? Right, the responses fall um, across all four of those categories. Um, especially with wear a mask from 90 to 70, but most dramatically was the social distancing. 80% of people said that authorities say you should be social distancing, but then only 27% said that they were actually social distancing. Um, and then when we break this down by political party, there are some interesting uh, things come out of this. When we asked people, what do authorities say? you should do right they're saying you should limit exposure 58 percent um, and within that category there's roughly equal numbers of democrats and republicans saying that to limit your exposure you should avoid large crowds but then there were 46 percent of democrats compared to 29 percent of republicans saying that uh, to limit your exposure you should avoid public or you should just stay at home and then when we ask people what they were actually doing we get this idea that 65% of Democrats um, are saying that they are limiting their exposure compared to just 26% of Republicans. So there's definitely a difference between what um, Democrats and Republicans think when it means, think that it means to limit your exposure and then how much they are limiting their exposure. Um, and then the other significant finding was that Republicans are more likely to say that they are not worried or they are not doing much to prevent contracting um, the virus, so that was 19% of Democrats compared to 1% of, no, sorry, that was 19% of Republicans compared to 1% of Democrats. Um, but it is important to note, like, the, of those people who said that they were not worried or they were not doing much, um, most of them still were using at least, like, one preventative measure. Is this you, Dr. Mahoney? I think this was Emily, yeah. Oh, okay, 
I can take this one. Sure. Um, so when asked uh, specifically about uh, social distancing and the question was, what are you doing about still seeing your friends? Um, we found that 24% of our respondents specifically talked about how they didn't necessarily follow the guidelines. Um, and this included um, still seeing small groups of friends or seeing specific friends or um, seeing a, like a significant other that they had that they didn't necessarily live with. So still seeing people outside of their household. Um, and this was only 12 Democrats, but 23 Republicans who talked specifically about not following guidelines. Um, when meeting with friends virtually, how we did find that Democrats were more likely to discuss um, seeing their friends virtually. So 17 Democrats talked about seeing their friends online compared to only eight Republicans. But when you look at gathering in small groups, Democrats were more likely to talk about gathering in small groups. So 22 Democrat, 22 Democrat, Democrats, so they would meet in small groups compared to only 17 Republicans. Um, and Democrats more likely to talk about them no longer seeing their friends. So what are you doing about seeing your friends? And they said, I'm not seeing them. Uh, nine Democrats said they would not see friends. Um, only three Republicans said that they were no longer seeing friends. When we asked, um, we asked three questions about wearing masks. The first one was how frequently do you wear a mask? 58% of students said always. So that was 59 out of 80 Democrats um, and 27 Republicans. The next most common response was most of the time. Um, that was the rest of the Democrats, almost um, 20 Democrats. And then about equal numbers um, of Republicans, 26 compared to the 27 saying that they are always wearing a mask. Um, no one said that they were not wearing a mask ever. And then we had 11% of students saying that they were wearing the mask about half the time or sometimes um, that was just one Democrat and 15 Republicans. So those 15 Republicans that are, that are only wearing it um, infrequently, that's actually 22% of total Republicans. When we asked people, where do you wear a mask? Um, the most common answers were anytime outside my home and car. Um, that was 29% of students. Then we had people would name specific places. They would say, I'll wear it to the gym, I'll wear it to school, I'll wear it to stores, um, I'll wear it to work. And then we had just this general idea of I wear it in public. Um, so those three, we all, there are more Democrats um, than Republicans in those three categories. Whereas Republicans were much more likely to say something like I wear a mask in mandated areas. Like if, you, there's a sign and you need to wear it to go into a store, I'll wear it inside the store. Um, so while that's only 17% of answers, that was 38% of total Republican answers compared to just 2.5% of um, total Democrats saying, I'll wear it in a mandated area only. Um, and then we follow that up and ask them why they choose to wear a mask. Um, they're, were kind of like these five, five explanations coming out of this. Um, a popular one, at least among Democrats, was I wear a mask to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, people were also saying something like, I wear a mask to protect myself and other people. Um, some people said that I wear a mask just to protect myself. And some people just focused on others and said, I wear a mask to protect others. You can see 16% um, of Democrats were focused on protecting others compared to just 0% of, re of Republicans. No Republican said that. Um, again, kind of following the where do you wear a mask is the why. For Republicans, they said that they wear a mask because it's a mandated obligation. So whereas only 4% of Democrats were saying that, 36% um, of Republicans were. And you can see a couple of quotes. Um, one white male Republican said, I wear it by law because it's forced. Um, a female black Republican said, I wear it because the government says so and I cannot enter shops without it. And outside of those five explanations was another category of other explanations. 16% um, of Democrats fell into that, but 30% of Republicans. So that was the second most popular explanation for Republicans, um, just kind of of a variety of answers, but there were uh, five or six Republicans within that giving an explanation of why they just did not like to wear a mask in general. Uh, 
Great. So um, following that, we asked um, the participants uh, questions about COVID-19 testing. So when they were asked if they would get tested, the overwhelming majority, 80%, said that they would get tested. And this made up 89% of the Democrats, 69% of the Republicans. Um, but looking at those who said probably yes, might or might not, or probably not, this was more likely to be Republicans. So about 30% of all Republicans fell into one of these probably or might categories compared to only 11% of Democrats. Um, and then the only one person said that they would not get tested and that was a Republican. So then they were asked, following that, they were asked why, they, why or why not um, would they get tested? Um, and you see a similar response to uh, why or why not a person would wear a mask with the main reason being to protect others or to stop the spread. So 32% of the respondents said that they would get tested so that they could protect someone else or know, know that they had it so they couldn't keep spreading it. And this was more Democrat of Democrats compared to only 28% of Republicans. Um, however, if you look at our next largest category, um, to know what they would do if they were positive, so they would get tested to know um, if there were certain instructions they needed to follow if they did test positive. This was an even split by political party. Um, and you have a similar pattern with the next one um, that they would get tested if they were if they had symptoms or if they were knowingly exposed. So if someone that they knew they had come in contact with um, tested positive, then they would uh, get tested to see if they were also positive. Um, the already tested category, 9%, um, this included people that had been tested before and tested negative, and so they wouldn't get tested again, but it also included people who had been tested before and would get tested again. So 9% um, of people expressed they had already been tested. Um, and then if you're looking specifically at why people did not want to get tested, uh, the most common response is that they just felt it would take too long. Um, so 5% of people thought the testing process was too long, um, and this was more Republicans. And you um, also included people who felt the test looked uncomfortable or that it hurt. Um, and then the 2% of people felt that they couldn't trust the test or the results, that there was too many. And this um, included narratives about um, there being false positives and false negatives in regard to testing, and that would uh, make people hesitate on whether or not to get tested. And then we asked them, um, what would you do if you did get a positive test result? Um, and then these answers closely reflect um, answers to a questions about what participants would do if they thought they had COVID um, without being tested. So we saw similar results where the most common response overwhelmingly was just quarantine or stay at home. So 89% of participants said that they were quarantined. And this included 93% of the Democrats and 84% of Republicans. So this was a really common response that people would just quarantine or stay at home. Um, interestingly, only 26% of people said that they would notify others that they tested positive. Um, and this included 29% of Democrats and 22% of Republicans, but only 26% of our sample actually said that they would get, uh, or that they would tell other people that they were positive. Um, and this followed with uh, treat symptoms medically. So just find ways to treat the symptoms and get themselves through um, having COVID. And then 14% of people discussed getting tested multiple times until they essentially received a negative response. And then we also asked questions about uh, vaccines. And one of the questions was, would you get a COVID vaccine? So these interviews were conducted before there was an announcement of a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so that before we knew that it was going to be available and things were still very much in development. Um, so while these while these took place before a vaccine was there, what we're seeing here was there's actually um, a great deal of vaccine hesitancy and a general lack of information about vaccine development um, across the board, but um, between both political parties. So while 59% of the total sample said they definitely or probably would get um, a vaccine, um, there was 33% said maybe or probably not, um, and 7% said definitely not. And if you're looking at this, maybe, probably not, this was, you know, 56% of that 33 were Democrats and 44% were Republicans. So despite a uh, political party, there is still a sense of vaccine hesitancy across the board. And then um, we asked, we asked reasons why or why not, again, would someone choose to get, 
choose to or not to get vaccinated. Um, and looking at the responses that were more about, yes, I would get vaccinated, 26% of people um, would do that to protect others. So again, this protect others narrative comes up. 13% um, of the respondents specifically stated that they trusted vaccines and vaccine science, but this was made up of 20% of the Democrats said this and only 4% of Republicans noted trusting vaccines. Um, other people said I would get a vaccine if it was required. So if their school or job required them to get a vaccine, they would get it. Um, and then 4% of people expressed wanting to get a vaccine so they could they didn't have to keep worrying about COVID-19 or that they could essentially return to normalcy. Like they wanted everything to get back to normal. Um, if you look at the people who were somewhat hesitant, um, so they might get a vaccine, um, the overwhelming reason for this hesitancy was wanting to wait to see the effects on others. So 23% of the 23% of people talked about wanting to wait. Um, so this included people who said um, probably yes or probably no or maybe that they would wait and see and they wanted to know what the vaccines would look like or how people would respond to the vaccines um, during like so the first round of rollout. So they wouldn't want to get it right away. They would want to wait to see how other people reacted to the vaccine before they got it themselves. And then 11% of people discussed how getting a vaccine would depend on the research outcomes or if it was going to cost because at that point we did not know if the vaccine was going to be free. Um, and those people who said they would not get vaccinated 7% of the sample talked about not trusting the government or vaccines. 4% 4 4 of people felt it was rushed um, or what was common was to say they didn't want to be guinea pigs. And that was quite a few people said specifically they didn't want to feel like they were guinea pigs. And then 2% of people said that they already had COVID so they didn't feel that they needed to get vaccinated against it. Sure, I can, I guess, do some final remarks here. Um, thanks for all of uh, that information. Um, you know, so for conclusions here, we are, you know, obviously thinking through how we can turn these into recommendations for various bodies, and we can talk about that maybe more during the Q&A, but there were some clear differences and there were some clear overlaps that we saw. Um, and, you know, so looking at this by political party, and then we can get maybe more in the, in the discussion into some of the other aspects here besides political party. But when it comes just to learning, there's a clear difference between how Democrats and Republicans are approaching online learning. Democrats tend to talk much more about how they prefer online learn learning, um, despite the fact that both political parties, if you're looking at overlaps, are concerned more with their education than with their health. And so the arguments for, for example, why Republicans prefer face-to-face -face versus why Democrats prefer online learning is of interest revolves actually around issues of learning uh, more so than, than health, even though it's very obvious when you look at the data, Democrats do tend to know more about specific treatments. They do tend to know, or they are twice as likely, I should say, to follow a lot of the social distancing mandates, to wear masks, um, Republicans, when you look at some of the extreme categories in terms of saying they're not going to get vaccines um, and they don't wear masks, they don't social distance, there's still that sort of mass of Republicans on that end who tend to say that they don't do those things. So there are some of these key differences here. Um, but those key overlaps are also present uh, where people are getting information. One thing that we didn't discuss yet is that there was a high rate of people talking about how they don't really trust information or they go to multiple sources to try to verify information. Um, there also tends to be, when it comes to testing, relatively equal willingness to be tested. And then in those most recent slides there on vaccines, what you're actually seeing is there's not a lot of actual political party difference there between, there's a, there's a bit more um, Democrats that are willing to get the vaccine. But even when you get into the the range of those who are hesitant, there isn't actually a, a real big difference there by political party. So um, we can go into a Q&A section here in a second, but one of the interesting things that we're finding from all of this is that while some of this matches, you know, the larger narratives around hesitancy, for example, and difference in political party when it comes to knowledge, there are also things here that don't necessarily map, match those those assumptions, you know. So for example, I think one of the things we see is that among Democrats, there's actually a lot of difference 
um, in terms of how people and why people are identifying as Democrats, but also um, in terms of their knowledge in particular. So that was one in particular that stuck out um, in our data that Democrats are not necessarily more knowledgeable if you include some of the variations within that group. Um, but with that, let's, let's stop with all of the PowerPoint and we can turn this over to questions. And thanks, oh, now I can see how many people are here. Thanks for being here. Um, feel free to turn your cameras on or use your mic or use your hand, you can raise your hand. Um, so uh, Ate, um, well actually, and, and I think I, I, maybe I'll address this. Uh, Ate has put a comment in here um, that in fact he was surprised that 60% of people don't report washing their hands. And I had maybe half jokingly said that these are Americans, they don't wash their hands. And I'll say that I, I drew that on my experience from in Kenya, where people often do eat with their hands and then openly make fun of Americans because they often don't actually wash their hands. They're used to using utensils. Um, and this is actually, I think, a stereotype that is that is rooted in reality uh, when you leave the United States that Americans don't wash their hands. And so actually, I think there's, there's something there actually possibly around hand washing, but the bigger, um, the bigger question, do you want me to read your question or do, would you like to? Okay, so, so the question is for an outsider, the fear of cost with the vaccine is very interesting. Um, I have that fear with things like uh, dentist and any doctor's visits. So if you're coming to the US and you're used to a, a system where you have universal health care or, or government sponsored health care. So, so after we get vaccinated, we had a discussion on that topic. It was very utopian in a US context. The government is giving free health care and it was organized very well. So will there be any recommendations related to that aspect? Um, and I guess that's, I mean, I would, I would, I think that, you know, I think this has been something that just, I think has been rather successful in the fact that people without having to worry about health insurance are able to immediately access, you know, vaccines. Um, at the same time, I know just from experience with some of the other groups that there are still groups in the US who are worried about their documentation and then are still worried about going to these places even if they say anybody can come. There's this fear of you know the surveillance and they're gonna document you. And I think that overlaps with some of the fear um, that we've seen from others. Um, about like, you know, chips and tracking and you know what they're actually gonna do when they give you these vaccines or tests. But um, I, I think that this would be definitely something that we would want to recommend that this kind of, you know, obviously free vaccine outreach is important because cost was in there as a, as an issue, but, but yeah, Robbie, you have your hand up, please. Uh, yes. Um, Sophia is on the call. Sophia was in Dr. Mahoney's class in fall and Edgardo Mejias was in my class during fall. And I was wondering if either or both of them would like to talk for a couple of minutes about just the experience of uh, doing the interviewing on this project, participating in the analysis. Both of them did the initial analysis in fall and then worked on the, addi the um, additional follow-up analysis this spring. So Sophia, I'll ask you to go first. And then after that, Edgardo, if you'd uh, like to uh, say a little bit about your experiences, we'd like to hear those as well. Sophia? Uh, sure, yeah. Um... So I've done a lot of previous projects with classes, but this was the first one where it was completely remote. And I thought that was really interesting because it was um, a chance to participate in this long interview process. I've never conducted an interview either. So this was, it was a really great experience as an undergrad to be able to participate in the research and data analysis part of this project. And it was really great to see it all the way through. Same for me, I, um, I did the class with um, Dr. Um, Bear, and I then worked with Sophia on the coding and uh, going through the analysis, um, doing everything online, which made it a little bit more difficult when this time. But it was really interesting to see, um, doing the analysis, to see the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we had to do a lot of back and forth with the coding, uh, fixing things, uh, 
to in order to cope better for things. So that was an interesting and a, a great learning experience overall. So I'm very glad to have done this. Ah, uh, Caro. I'm sorry if I didn't say that right. It's it's Caro. Caro. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I just got a comment on the um on the vaccine um category from somebody who's actually from Germany. And uh, when COVID first started, uh, my mom always said, "Yeah, um, everything was going a little quicker than it was here in the United States as far as um COVID spread prevention went and all that stuff." But now that we all have the vaccines, it's the complete opposite because they, they've been telling me that over the last couple of weeks, whereas we're over here in the States, we're vaccinating left and right. Germany can get, can get off their asses, excuse my language, but they, they can't get, get up there, which I think is really interesting where it's almost role reversal. Any anyone want to comment on that one? Uh... Uh, can I comment? Sure, please, please. Yeah, so I, I'm from Finland, and it's kind of the same situation that lockdowns, all these things, were maybe somehow at least better performed uh, in the early stages, but then the vaccination stuff is not happening, and I think it's it, it's not due to you know governments in Europe or, or I think it's more to do with access to the vaccines and of course the U.S. right has a lot more companies and uh, money and uh, the, it's a superpower so taking stuff is easier uh, than for a small country like Finland. Um, Germany of course is a much bigger country than, than right. Finland. But... Do you think it has anything to do with bureaucracy? Yeah, Ravi, do you want to? Um, I don't know about bureaucracy, but I did want to say um, Americans like technology. They like a quick fix. Um, the idea of socially organized um, approaches, lockdowns, changing one's behavior, wearing masks. These were fought by Americans, but the technology, uh, the technological fix, um, you know, the, the medicine versus the public health approach. I think this resonates uh, with Americans. And, um, you know, as opposed to people in other parts of the world who are much more willing to do the social kinds of things, the public health kinds of measures, um, uh -huh. the Americans like the idea of the vaccines. Of course, the accessibility issue is also very important, but I think there is a part of, of sort of um, the different cultures that plays into this as well. Gotcha. Well, thank you. I, I've been following the news. I think that's an interesting question because I've been following the news um, in Europe um, and there has been a lot of back and forth within the European Union uh, about AstraZeneca and um, Johnson & Johnson. Yes. Um, very safe. So um, the government, I think uh, governments in Europe have been having a hard time sending a clear message to the people. Um, so it might seem some people might be reluctant or, you know, specific governments have become a little bit reluctant. And I think it's because there seems to be lack of transparency um, by the uh, European Union bureaucratic. That's true. Yeah, that's really interesting. Hmm. I wanted to add, I don't really know that much about the German medical system, but I've been surprised in the US um, of how like much private collaboration has happened to get like the, the vaccines outright because we have, um, you know, like Walgreens or like even Walmart, yes. you know, like giving out the vaccines. Um, I, I got my vaccine at Walmart actually, and they had shut down like the whole lawn and garden section. So I thought it was like really like striking to, you know, like be in this like private store, but then have like this other like mini space within it. This become like this kind of like governmental um, like vaccine space. So I think that might also, I don't know if Germany is um, doing something like that or plans to or anywhere in Europe really, but just to see like that collaboration, I guess, between like, mm -hmm. um, you know, like private business and like the government here has been um, 
yeah, like I said, really striking to me. Yeah, I'm not sure if they have anything like that in place over there. Um, I know a lot of people go through like their medical, um, what do you call it, uh, primary healthcare provider. Um, they have sites like vaccine sites, but I think I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think it's all government regulated. Like you would not find that kind of collaboration where you would just go into, I don't know, a Walmart and, and, and find that. I don't think so. I, I, think, I think that the German case is an interesting one because I think Germany uh, in the beginning, they had the infrastructure for um, right. in and everything ready. So there seems there also seems to be that I think Germany is right now um, they're in politi political um, contest. They are with the election coming but up I, and all that stuff. Yes. Yes. I think that has become an issue for Angela Merkel. Um, she has having she, she's having a hard time sending a hey we need to vaccine message right now. Yeah, I I think so too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. This is a great discussion. And I mean, in some ways, this is like many multiple discussions really about what's happening around the world that you're following, like what's happening in South Africa versus Brazil versus what's happening in India right now. Um, there was actually just a big conference. To, uh, I think it's still going on today. It started yesterday at, at University of Florida Gainesville that just looks at Kenya and what's happening in Kenya during um, they're in lockdown again right now. So it's, I mean, yeah. it's again, these are these are fascinating discussions and 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 um, I just just there's been another question here uh, and maybe it does speak back to this issue of technology and the cultural relationship with technology and I'm I'm very interested in this. But um, there was a question here for, uh, from Faith. I, I like technology. Do you think social media plays any part in our perspective, education, and or knowledge of COVID and um, I'd actually, I'd like, I'd love to hear from some of the others who have been through our data to talk about this and, and who are part of this, but I'll just say quickly speaking that what the, the data say that yes, just strictly speaking, people replied that yes, social media is a major source of information, <laughs> um, but you can also say therefore a source of maybe misinformation. I don't know if any others want to speak to that though from our set of data. Shay or Sophia or... Yeah, I'll throw out one thing that's been on my mind when I was reading it. Um, and when people say like, why will you wear a mask? I feel like I saw or heard like on through the media, like this narrative, like wear a mask to like to protect yourself and others, right? And I don't know if you remember, but like there were quite a few um, Democrats and even Republicans saying that. And like in the data, there are multiple people just kind of like saying this verbatim, like I wear a mask, to protect myself and others like multiple times right so um for me I, I feel like that is something like coming like straight out of the media so i have thought about a little bit like this overlap between like how we feel and like the media that we can feel um, i haven't thought about it much more deeply than that but i did think that that was like really noticeable Yeah, I agree with that. Um, that's also reflected in the sources. Um, social media was the primary sources that people were getting their COVID information from, like news, television. These weren't really the primary sources that college students were getting their information from. So it was more likely like a Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. This is where people were going and they were following these narratives that the media had essentially built up for them to use. And they were just cross-checking it for themselves, sort of verify their own position. Yeah, no, I was just. And I mean, also to go along with that. Oh, sorry. No, to go along with that, there also were like a number, I think, about like almost 30 people that specifically said that it's hard to trust information that's on social media. So I think, along with people using social media to information, there is also um, the college students are cognizant of the fact that not everything read on social media is true and that this information does spread. And so I think. What we're seeing or what we're going to see is that a lot of people having to find ways to confirm what it is they read and where they're accessing their information. And I think we're seeing people that are doing that. That's good. Yeah, I think when we dig in deeper to the later questions, when we talked about like um, identity, we talk about like social movements, we ask questions like, what do you like about the US? What do you not like about the US? Um, that was coming up quite a bit was this idea like, I don't like the 
you know, like the misinformation or like this. Um, so I think that those narratives are also within some of this a lot later data too. I was gonna say, if nobody wants to add any, do you wanna say anything more, Shay, about some of those later questions that you're still sort of over your head in analysis? And, and just to give those of you here an idea of these questions, we asked questions like, what do you not like about being in America? What do you like about growing up in America? But to 148 different people. So that's a lot of, it's a lot of words to code and to deal with. So I don't know if Shay, you wanna talk just a little bit about what that says to some of you know, our discussions here. Um, yeah, there, I have like a million things swimming through my mind right now. Let me try to pull one. But um, there was, you know, it's like really striking how a, one of the things that people talk about is across um, demographics that people are tired of like the politicized atmosphere. Um, but then it's really interesting then to like see this like very wide political spectrum in a lot of questions where people, um, you know, when you say like, what do you like about the US? And like so many Republicans are like everything. And then the other one's like, what do you not like about the US? And so many Republic or so many Democrats are like, nothing. Like, I don't like anything about the US, right? And then like, do you feel like an American? So like some Republicans, um, there's maybe some Democrats in there too. They're like, yeah, like, I feel like patriotic. Like I like our culture. And then we have like this flip side where people are like, no, I'm like ashamed to be American. Like I'm not patriotic um, was like a big thing coming out. Like a multiple, like I think like 10 Democrats are like, I'm not patriotic. Um, so just like this really interesting, like really extremes, but then also like a lot of overlap um, is coming out, which is probably very reflective of our media environment to tie that back to like the media, right? Yeah, Ravi? Yeah, um, as Shay is talking about how everything uh, was very politicized, I think we need to think back to the time space only a few months ago, but the time space when this study was done, this was September, very, very early October of 2020. Um, and quite honestly, uh, I was not gonna line up and get a vaccine at that point. And it appeared that there was pressure from the, um, presidential administration to push those vaccines out quickly. There appeared to be a lot of pressure on the CDC, the FDA. I was not lining up for a vaccine and I was quite surprised that the students were as enthusiastic as they were about vaccines uh, and other kinds of things. So well, I think when we write this up, we have to sort of get back to that time space and when you think about how we have moved from that time space to where we are now, it is extraordinary. The lack of coordination, okay? You put places like the UK and Germany with national healthcare systems, they don't need to give um, shots at Walmart or Walgreens. They have healthcare centers that everybody goes to. We didn't have that. And the need to forge this public-private partnership this need to get all sorts of very hesitant people off the fence about vaccines, all the rest of that. Um, going from where we were then to where we are now, I think is a major miracle um, because um, there are a few countries that have done as bad a job in handling COVID as the United States and few that have actually gotten a vaccine initiative together as successfully again with the qualification that we bought up all the vaccine in the world. But still, you can imagine scenarios under which even having bought up all the vaccine, we would have been unable to get it out. And that's not a hard situation to conjure up, but that was actually overcome. And think about, again, last September, early October, to now, middle to end of April, again, kind of a major miracle. I think, well, so Caro has another question. Faith, you had unmuted quickly. I don't know if you wanted to follow up. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I just had a quick question what um, Ravi was just saying. Um, 
So now how can a country like New Zealand be COVID free, be one of the last countries to get COVID and be COVID free in such a short amount of time? Um, is it literally just the sheer size of the country? I, I lived in New Zealand for a year when I was, well, 17. But anyways, um, they have what, 4 million? And ha the population is like 4 million, which is not even New York City. Um, is it just contributed to the size of the country that they're COVID free now? Or why do you think um, they, they are without the disease now in comparison to the rest of the world? I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that they're an island, so it's easy to, to control access. You just basically sure. shut down one major airport. Auckland is the only international airport, so you just shut that down and you mm -hmm. control the United States. You have millions of international airports. Um, it's a smaller country. Um, there's a strong national health system and there was extremely strong leadership that people yeah. got behind. Um, it's a very different kind of country where there is much more of a collective sense of we do things for each other. Um, mm -hmm. We did see some of this coming out of some of the um, East and Southeast Asian countries as well. And um, people just, it was a case of, we're gonna do this for us, as opposed to in the United States, where Im immediately everything got politicized. Right. So you have a number of factors, but here's another case where I think culture is a real important variable. And if you want to um, uh, email me at some point, I yes. have a really fascinating uh, PowerPoint um, comparing the situation in uh, New Zealand and a couple of other places. And it's really striking um, the kinds of measures they took. Very, very strong leadership um, at the national level and everybody bought into that leadership. So email me and I can okay. forward that PowerPoint. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I want to, I do want to bring it back. I, that was originally Faith's question on social media, but I think, you know, just to say one little thing about that political context too, like the American political context, I think it's also, there's a sort of political fatigue and also you could maybe say a social media fatigue, um, right? So there was like, if you think of, for example, QAnon, QAnon existed before the pandemic, but the impact of something like the politicization of that kind of misinformation then during a pandemic, those just became this very, you know, perfect storm of the not you know the the politics and the social media and and, and the pandemic coming together. So, uh, yeah, Faith, so back to you. Um, mine is like a different question, but it kind of connects to it. Um, so I don't want to like like um, offend anybody, but I've heard this before. So my question is. Um, do you think people may have answered their questions in a certain way because of their political party affiliation? Because I've heard people say, well, I'm a Republican, so I think this way, or I'm a Democrat, so I think this way. Do you think that was possible in any of those questions? Does anyone wanna? Sophia, you asked these questions of other students. What did you think? Um, yeah, I definitely felt that way when I was interviewing my people um, because, yeah, like I would just have different conversations and like the different questions that I asked, they answered a certain way. And then when we got to the identity based questions, they kind of changed the tone of their answers. So I definitely think that's possible, but I don't know how prevalent that was throughout the whole survey. So, but it's definitely a potential bias that is in there. That was certainly our hypothesis. And the sample was designed where each student in the classes was asked to interview one Republican and one Democrat. Both had to be USF students, preferably who'd been in school for at least a year. So they'd had online classes in the spring. And those were our sampling criteria. Beyond that, we didn't try to make it a tighter sample because we figured this was hard enough for our poor students to have to find people and do this interviewing uh, over Zoom or, or something like that. 
But yeah, I think that I, mean, I think this is where we didn't really try to hide the fact that this is something we were interested in. And so as a result, I think, you know, from our perspective, analyzing this, you know, we're trying to be very aware of this fact that we were, and that's what I think Dr. Bayer meant when she said, you know, we were doing these interviews a month or two before the election. So I think definitely people were going to be thinking about these things and answering. And so we just have to understand that that's part of the, you know, the answers that we're getting, the data that we have speak directly to how people and like like Shay said, it was it was kind of amazing how many answers were almost word for word the same thing, you know. And you wonder where are people getting this from, right? Because they're getting it from certain places, whether it's whether they know it or not. And so they're reproducing certain things. And so that's what we were kind of looking at is you know when we see people saying the same thing. So for example, things like you know I I, I read through these really carefully, but the grumblings the grumblings about mask wearing were very interesting. Um, yeah, I wear a mask, but only because I have to, or only because of this mask, you know, the, I wear a stupid mask, you know, like these little extra things that are included. And then it's not real surprising when you look over and see that those are all Republicans. And, and then so you wonder, is this, is this inherent in being Republican? And actually, I would guess, you know, knowing Republicans, there's actually nothing inherent in the mindset of Republicans that says don't wear masks. Um, many Republicans are construction workers who have to wear masks to keep dust out of their mouths and noses every day. But, um, but this became politicized, right? In a very specific way where the mask becomes, you know, symbolic in a sense of something bigger. And I think that's where we're exactly what we're getting from a lot of, a lot of these data. And that gets even harder when we do have questions on, you know, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? What do you think about All Lives Matter? Do you have any recommendations for the leaders of these movements? And then it, it gets even more, I think, extreme in terms of how we see this stuff being repeated through various echo chambers or such. But yeah, please. Um, so I was thinking about like social media, like we were just talking about. It's like a big platform. What about things like like your peers, your family, like peer pressure? Like, did that have anything? Like, do you think that could have kind of affected it as well? I'll jump in. Um, I think that I am guessing that it impacts people, what people interviewed, but I was going to say specifically um, that there were quite a few um, Republicans and Democrats, right? Like talking about being a Republican or being a Democrat because of their family. So I think that kind of like speaks, you know, directly to like our family is like our first culture idea. And like people were explicitly drawing that line. Like I am, Republican or like I'm a Democrat because like these this is my family's values like this is what I know um, or like my mom is so I am um, so I, I do think that is like an important part like of what you're asking I definitely think um, our family has an impact on us. Well and it also got to the point where we had we actually had a lot of trouble recruiting Republicans. <laughs> And there was a sampling issue. And I remember, you know, you tell your class to go do this. And then, you know, a week later, the students show up and say, we don't know any Republicans. <laughs> um, and that's, so that's actually a big sampling bias sort of issue that we're sending anthropology students, you know, medical students or, you know, pre-med students sort of, you know, off to do this. So we actually, we did have some students who were sort of self-identified Republicans who said, oh, I know some Republicans and, you know, I'll go recruit some Republicans. And so it got, it got kind of interesting. And, and I, I do th th think that we tried to avoid, um, I think in some ways the students were, were a pretty good, even like, like the, the Republican students were pretty good at not making the people they were interviewing feel uncomfortable. I mean, we really wanted people to open up and, and feel like they could share. And I think there are some examples of things that, I mean, I actually worry more that people tell us what we wanna hear as academics, right? Like that they're gonna say, yes, we follow all the rules because you wanna hear that we follow all the rules. And I think people were pretty openly, um, I don't know, but it, it, it does depend on those relationships with the inter interviewer. I just, real quickly, we're, we're a little over time. If anybody needs to go, please um, don't feel like you need to stay, but Ravi, yeah. Yeah, one thing about interviewing during a pandemic, this is actually an advantage, um, is that people have a fair amount of time on their hands. And I think, um, 
the students were willing to talk to us because they were just wanting to talk. I've noticed that my students come early to class. They hang around after class. There's a wanting of social interaction. And again, we're going back here to September where people weren't burned out on Zoom yet. And um, I think that contributed to the responses that our interviewers got. They were allowed to pick the people, uh, which helped. And again, when we ran out of Republicans, we had some students who were taking science or business classes and they say, oh, well, I'll get some of my people from the class. So I think there was, there was rapport already structured into these interviews going in. Um, and uh, I told my students to tell the people they were interviewing, you know, hey, I got this, I got this crazy professor, I got this horrible assignment I got to do for a grade, will you help me out? Every student understands that. And uh, I think uh, the students who were being asked to talk to us um, could identify with the pressures of what you have to do for a class and uh, were helpful. Well, yeah, thanks for those questions too. I really appreciate it. And, and for everybody who is here today, I think we're officially running out of time. It is a Friday. Uh, I don't know, Kieran, are we, should we, are there any final, final questions? No. I think this has been a, a really great, lively session. I mean, unless uh, the students or, or Professor Bear, you have anything to add or any of the audience members, I think this has been really great. Uh, we tend to have two of these per semester. Uh, I thank everyone for participating and hopefully stay tuned for more events like this in the fall. Have a great weekend. Have a great rest of your semester. Have a great summer and I hope to see you in the fall. So thanks for being here. Thank you. And, uh, have a good weekend. All right, and if anybody does have any uh, quick questions or wants to talk, I just put our emails in there and I can hang out for a couple of minutes. To talk. And I'll be here for a few minutes.